My name is James R. Spurrier, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Colonel, retired United States Army. Okay. Well, <coughs> being in, in the military school, well, most of us felt that we would eventually get into it after uh, Hitler invaded Poland. Uh, and the British were having a tough time, and it, we figured just a matter of time. So when I graduated, I went right in, well, right in the Army. And, and I stayed in the Army until I retired. Yeah, the summer of 1940. I, my, my first station was a lovely little place called Fort Ringgold, Texas, down on the on the Rio Grande, about 100 miles up the river from Brownsville, Texas. And it was a little squadron post. And in those days, we were rapidly trying to prepare ourselves for the ultimate, uh, you know, war against the Axis. And we were going to be called the Louisiana Maneuvers. And it was down in the swamps of Louisiana. <laughs> And I went there, what, three years in a row. And it was uh, quite an experience. Well, I was in the Horse Cavalry. In fact, I'm probably one of the last of the Mohicans in the Horse Cavalry. Uh, and I remember in 1941, Ben, uh, General Eisenhower, and later President Eisenhower, was uh, head of, of the maneuvers run by been uh, Third Army, and uh, there was some question in the military at that time, uh, the value of the horse uh, in battle. Well, we, always, we all knew that the machine gun uh, dictated different tactics, such as you, you didn't charge a machine gun. <laughs> and, and the days of the saber and clashing and charge, uh, was sort of going by the wayside. And we used the horse primarily then as what we call battlefield mobility, or the ability to move from A to B rapidly in the face of the enemy. So uh, there was some argument in the Army at that time, and the progressive thinkers figured that was the horse's served its purposes and to move on into mechanization. And General Eisenhower set up the maneuvers. And I I thought what he set it up to kill off the horses <laughs> because they really, really uh, rode us into the ground. Uh, in maneuvers, uh, you fight a little bit, then you stop, and the, the maneuver people reconstitute forces and et cetera, and you got ready for the next phase. And invariably, <coughs> we were on the right flank, and we had to be on the left flank to start the man maneuver, so we were going all the time. And they, they did a pretty good job. I remember saying, and, and the old horse cavalry, you march for 50 minutes, and you took a 10-minute break. <laughs> In the middle of the night, I've seen the cavalry trooper and his horse lying down on the ground, <laughs> dead, dead to the world. So it was quite an experience. I mean, we'd ride, you know, one, I remember one time we, 100 miles, we went, went 100 miles before we stopped. Mm. Mm. In uh, spring of 38, I was graduating from junior college that summer. And OMA, or Oklahoma Military Academy, Polo Wife was sort of a, a farm school for the University of Oklahoma. And I, I had already, they, they had contacted me and made arrangement for me to go to OU. And then our, my PMS and T, they, got a hold of me and said, there's a school back in Pennsylvania who would like to have your services at the polo plant. So I'd never 
heard of CMC, and so I uh, made it a point to try to find out a little more about it so we could make a, a, a sound decision of whether we wanted to go or not. And I say that because my buddy and roommate for that year, the name of Bud Hickman, they wanted both of us uh, to come, and we had just completed a, a, a very good season at OMA winning all of our games, and that's pretty tough to 21 or 22 games straight without uh, lose, losing. So uh, we were asked to come, and we knew that the best polo in the country was played here in the East. So we wanted to go where the best polo was being played, and that influenced us to uh, come to PMC. Uh, now it's a couple of country boys. <laughs> this was new to uh, us. We, we, we hadn't been across the Mississippi River before. So uh, it was a eye awakening, uh, you know, to come here and meet the people in the East. Uh, so we had a little trouble to start with uh, because we thought we'd start playing polo right away and found out that we mainly would play indoor polo. They used to call it indoor. They call it arena now, and that's where you play in an armory. And you had three men on the side. We'd never heard of it before. <laughs> so we, about a month into the program, I, uh, we want to know, when are we going to play polo? Uh, you have to wait till. November, and so we said, well, gee, maybe we ought to go somewhere else, and you know, Cappy Hype got a hold of us and uh, said, I'll get you a polo game, so he got us a couple of polo games, and that kept us here. <laughs> when I graduated from Oklahoma Military Academy, I was a cadet major there, so they came back here and wanted to make me a private. <laughs> Uh, that didn't fit, fit too well uh, with us. And uh, however, they decided that we would fit into the junior class. Otherwise, the uh, the first year in, in any military school, you go through the the hazing process, and et cetera. So they they said we could forego that. And they made a sergeant, so we 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 stayed and, uh, and integrated ourselves with the class. Well, of course, my fond memory was our polo coach, uh, Jim Chobo, a tremendous individual and person. Uh, he helped us a lot to get acclimated to. New, the new polo or, or, or indoor polo, we'd, which we had never played, so it took a little on his part to uh, get us to do what we're supposed to do. <laughs> Being different. Oh, completely different. Three men with a rubber ball inside of an armory. Uh, whole tactics and was different than uh, outdoor. Well, it's uh, four men on the team, and you play on a field 300 yards long and 160 yards wide. Uh, you could develop play better outdoors because you had the time and the distance to do it with. In arena, I mean, most of them are lucky to be 100 yards uh, in distance. And it was all enclosed, so uh, uh, you learn to play the ball off the boards uh, and a lot of different techniques uh, involved in arena polo. Well, not, not, not new when we came, but actually what it was up in the east here, like Chicago, uh, Cleveland, New York, uh, and all had armories and where uh, cavalry units trained in the wintertime 
so they could drill. And uh, someone decided that, gee whiz, so we, in the wintertime, let's have some fun <laughs> as well as drill. And they started playing uh, arena polo or indoor polo. Uh, I think uh, probably, I can't tell you exactly when it started, but r probably right after the <coughs> World War One. I was dedicated to the game of polo, so I found out real quick that uh, uh, your horse was a great percent of your your effort, and he had to be well trained, and he had to be schooled, and he had to be conditioned. So, right after classes every day, I'm down at the stables, uh, working my horses and uh, sharpening them up and getting them ready to go. So. I did not have a lot of uh, outside activities other than polo. Of course, I did a time or two look at a bell or two that walked down the street, but I mean, uh, outside of that, uh, I was pretty much devoted to the game of polo. Well, I, well, I was thankful for the discipline and all that uh, the military offered, which certainly helped me uh, when I went into the Army. I mean, I was, I was probably better prepared to join the Army than a lot of other people <laughs> who, who joined it, and I was thankful for that. And I was thankful for PMC to uh, provide me the opportunity to continue my military career. At that time, in the, well, starting in the mid-30s, the Army started the mechanization of, of the forces and the cavalry regiments, which were the, uh, the basic large cavalry unit, uh, they were being turned into horse and mechanized, into mechanized uh, cavalry units. And it was only, I was with the 1st Cavalry Division and we had four regiments, and uh, we had two National Guard horse, horse regiments, and that, that was it <coughs> in, in 1941. And unfortunately, the uh, 1st Cavalry Division, uh, when they dismounted us, which was the 28th of February, 1943, uh, they turned us into infantry and shipped us to the Southwest Pacific, where we fought from Australia to Tokyo, stopping off at the Philippines on the way up. I was a, a troop commander, or basically an infantry organization, later a battalion commander in the, in the war. December the 7th, 1941, we played a lot of polo at Fort Bliss. I was then stationed at Fort Bliss. And we had so many polo teams that we played at 11 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, my game was 11 o'clock in the morning. And that afternoon, uh, I'd only been married about a month. So I went home to take a nap. And uh, about five o'clock, or six, about six o'clock, I get this telephone call from my troop commander. He says, get out here and get out here right away. And I said, sir, no one works on Sunday. He says, where have you been? I said, I've been home. What are you at doing? Don't you listen to the radio? Says, no, sir, I wasn't listening to the radio. <laughs> he said, the Japanese have just bombed Pearl Harbor, and we're on a maximum alert and get out here. At that command, at time, I commanded was a, a, a recon platoon, uh, two scout cars and ten motorcycles. So I got out there, and of course, all of the troops were scattered hither and yon, and they were saying on a radio report immediately back to your organization. So they were coming in 
bits and pieces, and so they said, uh, grab anybody you can, get them in there, get them armed, and you're to go across town, there's a big tunnel. And you are to guard that tunnel. And I said, okie dokie, but why? And they said, well, if that's sabotaged, that's the only rail line we have here between the Gulf of Mexico and California, and it would take a, a month to get repaired. So being a nice second lieutenant, <laughs> we, we, we went. And the only time in all El Paso, Texas, the people adhered to the siren uh, uh, of authority. So I'm, I'm leading with my, on my motorcycle with a siren really going like that. And they got out of our way, believe it or not. But today, they wouldn't have get out of the way at all. So we got over there. And I said, got to do this real right, see. And so I put a machine gun at one entrance and a machine gun at the other entrance. And I got a, a walking patrol across the top of it. And uh, uh, I thought I was doing real good. And uh, I tried to stay awake as long as I could. And about 5 o'clock, I finally dozed off. And finally, I heard the walking patrol of her hollering, Oh, 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 you SOB, or I'll shoot you. And I came came to life and ran up there and I went back. We <laughs> came across the border go, going to work, and this uh, young cook had a sub submachine gun Said, trying to shoot him. Thank God he wasn't qualified in it because he didn't know how to activate it. Or, or I could see myself reply by endorsement here on you're killing a Mexican national. <laughs> uh, got out of that one without too much trouble. <laughs> so that was I, what I remember about December 7th. The polo first started at PMC in 1922. And they played, as far as I know, I think in 1942, because they had a 20-year period in there. Uh, in the late 20s, uh, the uh, uh, team was able to capture the intercollegiate tournament. That's the elephant right there. Like Nebraska's ahead right now with <laughs> in football. So, uh, in the 30s, in the mid-30s, it, uh, the caliber polo at PMC apparently dropped off, and that's where I really sent out and got up bolster it up and I remember uh, the first time we went to Squadron A up in New York City we were to play against a highly touted uh, uh, Evergreen Farms team with some very fine players on it and it was about my second or third game in it and we were able to whip them <laughs> and that started us off we uh, I think we won our first seven or eight games where we got knocked down to our, where we probably should have been to start with, but uh, it was a very successful year. And uh, my last year, uh, we beat every intercollegiate team in the circuit. That's Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, West Point, uh, Norwich, uh, and we got to the finals of the intercollegiates, and unfortunately, Bud Hickman had horse problems, had trouble with horses, so he wasn't very mounted. And you got to be mounted to play in that league to to be able to win. So it uh, hurt us very much not to be able to win the intercollegiates for PMC at that time. Still bothers me. <laughs> proud. Very proud. Very, very, very proud of what they've done since PMC uh, rode off into the sunset. I just uh, open mouth and, and, and admiration of what has been done uh, in, in the past years.